are some intangibles that those projections failed to take into consideration. The crowd was going crazy. There's not much in life that's better than that. You're listening to Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys on the 95.7 The Game Podcast Network. Hello there. Welcome back to the Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys podcast. Sam Loveman here as always. Well, not quite as always, but back with me this week is Joe, but the butcher boy Shasky, uh, platooning back in over Mark Willard now this week uh, after a much well-earned vacation. Shasky, this is episode number 70. 70 used to be the single season home run record. That was brought back uh, when Mark McGuire did that, but then Barry Bonds broke that in 2001. And uh, that's just my ham-handed uh, segue into saying happy anniversary to Barry Bonds for breaking the all-time home run record. I thought you were going to go George Contos on me, number 70. <laughs> that's true. I could also go there as well. Uh, not very many other notable 70s in Giants history. No. Uh, 70s was not a great decade for the Giants either. But, yeah, it was, <laughs> we are uh, we're recording this on Monday, August 7th. And, yeah, this is 16 years uh, to the day that Barry Bonds broke the all-time home run record. Chassie, was that one? Were you there or were you watching that one on TV? No, I was at home, and I remember when he uh, obviously hit the home run to dead center field, and a guy from New York by the name of Matt Murphy ended up catching the ball. That's right, and there was the whole thing. I think he sold it. Yeah, because he was wearing like a Mets shirt. Excuse me, does that sound better? I've got my... Yeah, it does sound better with the microphone, yeah. My bad. Uh, Didn't even I have my mic like ready. a Mets fan or something that caught yes. it. Yes. And he sold well, to the dude who, who branded it. Um, I remember One I of my that. dear friends is named Matt Murphy. It's the only reason why I remember that. <laughs> uh, so I remember I was at that game. Um, my dad... Uh, no had, way. Matt, my dad was, had to entertain a, a client that night, so I got to go along. We were sitting in the second deck, and that's one of those things like, there's some things like I can't tell you what I had for dinner last Thursday, but I could tell you all the details of that home run. I remember Bonds leading off the plate, leading off that inning, uh, stepping to the plate, friend of the morning rose, Mike Bassick's on the mound. I remember it was a 3-2 count. I remember thinking 3-2 count, man, this this could be the moment where he does it right here. He hit number 73 on a 3-2 count. Why not? As soon as I think that Bonds sits to the deepest part of the yard, I always remember him throwing his arms up. How old were you? I was, this was right before I went to eighth grade. I know. I remember the Giants also lost that game eight to six to the Nationals that night. Barry Zito took the loss. And uh, I swear from the fifth inning to the eighth inning, there was just this buzz around the ballpark. Like half the ballpark was empty because everyone was going to buy merchandise at the time. But I remember thinking there for like an hour, just like, I just saw that. I just saw Bonds hit the break the all time home run record. And it was just one of the coolest moments uh, I've ever experienced at just at a baseball game. And yeah, it just, it felt like it was just like such this incredible finale to it. Just a great moment. What was not a great moment at a, a baseball game was uh, the moments I had at the Coliseum this past weekend. Uh, Giants swept in this two-game set by the A's, and by default, they ended up losing the bridge trophy that I know we're all crushed to see that go back to the Coliseum. <laughs> Even still, Shasky, I don't like losing the A's, whether good or bad, especially an A's team this bad. And the way the Giants did it, it really just looked like there was just no urgency at the plate. It felt like most of the most of the weekend. And that's what kind of irked me the most about this 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 series loss over the weekend. Well, I mean, let's 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 break this down because I, I wasn't that upset. I mean, I feel like the Giants have been, you know, really outperforming their what I believe to be what their actual skill level is. Like they have an elite bullpen, right? And and the mm-hmm. bullpen didn't play necessarily perfect in this one, obviously leaving Walker out there to kind of continue to just nosedive was Mm -hmm. questionable, but they don't have a lot of arms left right now. Like they've used a lot of arms. So I don't know, like Alex Cobb's been great all year. Can we really expect him to continue to be ace? Like, like it's not like he's been an ace at any other point in his career. He's really outperformed, you know, what my expectations were for him. And it, it feels like to me, even though Lamont Wade had a really nice game yesterday and JD Davis has knocked in some, some bigger RBIs as of late, at least the last couple of days, it does feel like the vets have kind of let this team down a little like Jock Peterson has been very quiet just in general this year. Um, Brandon Crawford, big error yesterday. Hasn't mm-hmm. been great. Has been injured a lot. Feels like we're watching the end of, of a great giants. It's inconsistent. Career, which- it is very inconsistent. Remember on Saturday, he had a couple really good plays at right? shortstop. Uh, you had one where he's going, you he, he was going to his right. He had a great play, just mm-hmm. vintage Brandon Crawford, nailed it, uh, threw it right to Lamont Wade at first base. And then the next day, it's the exact opposite. 
Um, and that's that's like, the kind of yeah, exactly. I mean, like Conforto. Saying. Conforto misplays a ball in the outfield. Conforto's mm-hmm. bat hasn't been as clutch as it's been in in maybe weeks past. And so I just feel like they're running out of steam. Like Wilmer Flores has been carrying them, and he's been very very good. But like Wilmer's not an everyday player. No, he's not. He's and, not. And a- to expect the young guys to carry this team, that's not fair. I'm not expecting Matos and Bailey to to carry them, but they have, and they've done mm-hmm. a pretty good job. I agree with you there. It it is a lot to ask. For when these uh, when these veterans aren't performing like especially i want to talk about just the bullpen usage over the weekend because there was the one the the, the ryan walker and luke jackson moments why on didn't saturday like and sunday that? what why didn't you like you were kind of mad that they didn't go out and get get help i was a little bit yeah let's touch on that a little bit because i just felt like there was uh, i i don't know what the move to be made is so the move i kind of highlighted was michael okay. lorenzen that's the kind of what i wanted because i figured it's it's going to win you a world series is he gonna work win you a World Series? No, probably not, but he's gonna lengthen that pitching rotation out a bit. And you need okay. that right now because yeah, you're right. Ryan Walker got, you know, he does look a little gassed. He came in on Saturday, and I think that was a that was a three batter rule issue. Like I think in past times after the uh after the first at bat, you're probably taking you. him out. Yeah, uh, Luke Jackson on Sunday, I think same thing. You could tell that first at bat, oh, he does not have it at all. And you know, whoever was that manager back in the day who used to make what 10 pitching changes a uh, uh, inning. We pay Lou. That's who it is. That's the former Giants manager I'm thinking of. He used to um, yank guys left and right. <laughs> well, I think it was. We'll, we'll, we'll get into Bruce Bochy at some point this week. But I always remember that game at Fenway in 2019, where they went to extra innings. I think, and Bochy had the full <laughs> compliment, you know, the full 40 man who was yes. disposable. I think he made like 20 pitching changes that night. I feel like that was the night that the three batter rule. It's like, okay, if there was any doubt, I call the I call the three batter rule the Bruce Bochy rule. I like That's that. Right. I'm, I'm kind of with who, you. Yeah, like who well, made the Lugie, the Lugie wall. Him? was really solidified with someone like Javier uh, Lopez. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I wanted to get a guy like a Lorenzi because it's, it's like a third or fourth starter you can add into this rotation that desperately needs more starting pitchers right now. Uh, because you look at the schedule that's coming up, and we'll get into that in a second. It's going to chew up. the. It's going to start to chew through the bullpen. And you are going to see it. Like when guys like Ryan Walker have off days, they're not going to happen very often. When they do, it's going to hurt a lot more. And a move like that, which I think would could have been doable, uh, the the guy that the Phillies gave up uh, to acquire Lorenzen was their number eight eight prospect. Uh, I'm gonna botch the name, so I'm not even gonna try it. Uh, but he was a shortstop second baseman. Um, and I looked at the Giants' number eight prospect. That's Mason Black, and kind of did a little bit more looking him up. And it's like they're similarly rated prospects. Are you doing Mike Mason Black for Michael Lorenzen? I mean, I would probably do that if it means giving your bullpen more health down the stretch and boosting your rotation for a potential playoff run. That's that's, it's not a splash move. It's not a bold move. It's not a move that I think you're going to regret in the future. And it's a move that helps you a little bit. Now I'm like, really I don't surprised. think that's much to ask for. No, no, I I'm with you, but I'm really surprised how down you are coming out of this series. Like I feel like the A's beating us twice in a row really has gotten to your soul. It, this was a this was a painful one. The Bay Bridge series always means a lot to me just because I, mean, I grew up with A's fan friends. Yeah. So there was always a lot of smack talk on the line. And honestly, like, again, the overall situation with the A's and their fans is terrible. I do obviously sympathize for them, but I also know A's fans are going to be some of the first to say, don't give us your sympathies. <laughs> and so I'll be honest. Yeah, going into this weekend, it like I joined in the sell the team chance. I obviously did that. Um, and that was a great moment there. And. But at the same time, like, no, I still want to beat you guys. Like, I still want to see the Giants crush the A's by 10 runs each time. Like, I've seen the A's blow out the Giants so many times, and it's just so frustrating. I want to get that back. Yeah, uh, no, I understand yeah, it, that. It's, it's, def- it's deflating just how the team played. I just – that ninth inning on Saturday, watching Conforto and da- – I think it was Davis and Conforto go to the plate. It was Conforto and Bailey go back-to-back, basically looking to walk. Uh, what was it? Just like they're just standing there like this the whole time, bat on the shoulder. It's like you're supposed to swing it. That's how this works, dude. Let me and let me ask I, you about Conforto. Let me ask you about Conforto. Yeah, clearly he's been healthier than I think a lot of people thought heading into the year. He's been he's been good at times, and then I feel like he's kind of hit a wall. Like th- doesn't it feel like he's kind of hit the wall the last three four weeks? It, no, it really has. And actually, I want to do a little bit of three up three down later. Okay. I got some more on Conforto I want to get into there, but yeah, no, it's there was a time when Michael Conforto came to the plate. You're like, all right, I'm going to sit up now. This guy might be yeah. doing something. Here comes the thump. Agreed. I don't feel that anymore with Conforto. Yeah. It's just the bat has gone so cold. And now you're seeing him, you know, mess up in the outfield. Again, that sun was brutal on Sunday. So no, it was really bad. The sun, it was hot. It was brutal. It was, yeah, I agree. that was a lot to deal with there. But at the same time, like you're, you're a eight, seven, eight year veteran in this league. Like 
stuff like that. You, it's kind of inexcusable. You can't really allow that. And it all just comes to circle on, on a roster that on good days feels incredible on bad days. The flaws just are so accentuated. And, you know, I don't want to use one bad week or one unfortunate weekend to just point fingers at Farhan, but you know what? Let's point some fingers at Farhan right here. Well, let me, um, let me ask you, Sam, before you continue, okay. like we agree the bullpen has been elite and that's the part that's been carrying this team offensively. What else is elite? There really isn't much right now. I mean, they're elite at striking out, but you're not supposed to be elite at that. Uh, it's just, I think they're, they're a bit better at runners in scoring position this year than I think in past years, but there really is no one thing that jumps off the page. So uh, I really want to throw this question at you, Shasky, because I think it'll be an interesting answer. So last week on the pod, when Mark and I were on the show, obviously it's no secret. Mark and I at the station are some of the more pro Farhan, uh, yeah, pro Farhan voices, but I wanted to kind of flip the, sk- the, the, the script on Mark and I a little bit. And we wanted to answer the question, why are so many fans out on Farhan? You know, we're in on it. So why do we think fans are out on Farhan? I want to flip this onto you because I know you're kind of out on Farhan right now. Why do you think there are so many fans who still buy into him or still loyal to the process these bots of the Giants? Why why do I think people are so loyal to him? Yeah. Guys kind of said, like, you know, Mark and I were the pro Farhan. So yeah. I want to be like, why are they anti? You're the anti Farhan. Why do you think others are pro? Because I, I do believe that there are a lot of Giants fans that view smart baseball, and I'm talking about the current wave of, of every what every team's doing, right? The Dodgers, mm-hmm. the Rays, you know, all of the advanced teams. It, there and even the Braves to that to that extent. I, I do believe like the Braves do a lot of advanced analytics stuff, but mm-hmm. they do it in their own little spin. I think we got tired of the way things were done with the gut and and not that they're not doing it with the gut now, but we wanted to be one of those smarter, shrewder teams. This is Silicon Valley. Like yeah. I do believe there are a lot of people that consider themselves a little more sophisticated. And so having a more intellectual brand of baseball, that's not so much grabbing your crotch and spitting. Mm-hmm. I do think that appeals to some segment of fans. I don't think that's all of them, but I also think that like, if we're being honest, Sabian had his run. Like mm-hmm. I, I look back and longingly at Sabian, but I also can acknowledge I think 20 years is a long enough time to say it's time for new blood. Like that's fair. Like I think it's fair, but, but I do believe that there are a lot of people that seen what Farhan did with the Dodgers, with the A's. And they think everything that the Dodgers have accomplished over the last 10 years can go back some way to Farhan. Everything the Dodgers have done, uh, the A's have done, excuse me, you know, prior to, to most recently can be pointed back to, to, to Farhan having his fingerprints all over it. And I'm just like, man, it's really hard to distinguish who's doing what in these front offices. Mm-hmm. And when you have so many guys that are getting credit, I, I don't know. Are these team wide decisions? Like, is Andrew Friedman amazing or was Farhan very influential on deals that maybe he wouldn't have been influential on and Friedman would have been out on is, is Friedman the one who deserves more credit? Is it, is it, you know, uh, Sabian's guy, Ned Coletti, who was there prior to, to Friedman going in there. Like, I, mm-hmm. I don't have the answer for those things. I think it's real easy to point when, when there's success and say that guy did everything or when there's failure, that guy's the reason why I think it's a lot harder than we want to give credit for. And so I don't know. It's, it's a very jumbled thing. I, I do think this, Sam, as I'm like skirting around your answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I I think Farhan, the metaphor of Farhan was renewed hope to getting back to being a champion. That I do think he signified we are going to be smarter. We're going to be more diligent with our money. We're not going to be as reckless in free agency. We're not going to trade away every single prospect just for a right-handed bat that might play every three days. Like at the end, the Giants had a bare cupboard. They had spent way too much money in free agency and they had no draft picks. Part of what made us love that team was the draft picks. And so I think that Farhan signified we're keeping our draft picks. I do. I think that that's yeah. what a lot of people like. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think there is, again, people love homegrown players. I really do believe that here in the Bay, just the Bay area in general, when you look not just in baseball, but through all sports, when it's the guys who came up naturally through these teams who are here the whole time, there's just a greater bond. You know, I, you're, you're never going to see guys like, I mean, Hunter Pence was acquired through a trade, but he was never going to be as loved as Buster Posey. Uh, Johnny Cueto, a great pitcher, but he was never going to be as loved as like Madison Bumgarner, no matter how well he pitched. It yeah. goes into basketball too, with Steph versus KD. Uh, I'm sure if the Niners signed some big time free agent in, in the NFL sense, you know, 
whether it's uh, Elijah Mitchell or whoever, it's that's just how the Bay Area is. We're loyal to our own. And yeah, so I think that does kind of make it fair to to want to expect Farhan to build it up through through the farm system. Uh, you kind of talk about how you know, the, the, the metaphor for him was the new hope and kind of doing things a different way. That's the thing that really struck out for me about Farhan, too. I always point to the line that Larry said was, you know, the next gen GM, next gen thinking. And that's kind of what led to my frustration at the deadline, because Farhan, he is supposed to be different. He is supposed to be new, cutting edge, fresh ideas. I always remembered that Zach Cozart deal that he did at, back in 2020. Uh, where he basically purchased that Cozart's contract to get a first round pick in Will Wilson. Now it didn't work out. Cozart ended up, you know, going nowhere and Will Wilson's kind of flamed out as a prospect, but the concept really intrigued me because I'd never seen that before. It's like, this I, is the I'm, kind of I different thinking you. that I want to see, but then we get to the trade deadline and it's just like, you're supposed to be the cutting edge next gen GM. And you, you said you, you compared him to an Alex Smith type. It's like, Farhan, you just seem like a, a GM right now or the, the president base, whatever title. Like you just seem like a guy at this deadline. I expect something a little bit more creative out of you. Now, if the deals just weren't there like at all, which it sounds like it was, that's one thing. But at the same time, like sometimes you got to make the moment. And well, I feel like agree? my frustration with Farhan is just he, he kind of disappointed me because I, I I think he's better than this. I think he could be more well, creative, I agree with you. smarter and craft a better deal. And it just seems so unlike him that he would just sit on his hands and just kind of watch this deadline further by doing absolutely nothing. If we were going to like make all of the things that we hated about Sabian, we put a list together. It would be giving Marvin Bernard a contract, right? A big mm -hmm. contract extension that it didn't feel like he was worthy of. It would be signing Aaron Rowan. It would be yeah. signing Barry Zito. It would the be AJ Brzezinski trade. The J okay, there I you go. Make sure that's included. <laughs> there you go. There you yeah. go. Like that. That's a good one. No, no doubt. Right. Like, uh, it's the Kellaris Beltron trade. Even though I still will stand by that trade. It's signing guys like Michael Tucker or Ryan Klusko years after they were good. Like years yeah. after they were good. Denard Span, Mark Melanson. They made more mistakes. Like you referenced one bad trade. They made more mistakes really via free agency. And although they're not multi-year mistakes that Farhan's made that have really anchored this organization, like they, the last couple of off seasons, they've heard pitching, these pitching signings have been really bad. The one that comes to mind, like Samarja and Cueto were not good signings. Like if we look back, Cueto mm -hmm. gave them a good year and a half, two years, but like, I think overall, you're kind of expecting that though, too. No, I agree. Yeah. But Matt Morris was a horrible signing. Horrible, going way back in time machine, right? Yeah. Horrible <laughs> signing. Di Scalfani looks like the Matt Morris signing. It's been horrible. He's like four and ten. He's given up 120 runs in two years since signing mm -hmm. the contract. Alex Wood has not been good. Haniger, the three-year deal to Haniger, it does. He's played 40 games, right? So mm -hmm. for all the great stories, like the Carlos Rodon story, the one-year wonder of Carlos Rodon, it feels like they've got four or five of these bad contract pitching deals and that's where i feel like oh my god we're repeating ourselves again no i agree i think the one saving grace is that you what farhan has done with the farm system in such a short uh time is really more or less insulating him from a lot of i think that the heat that would be on his seat in normal situations farhan has done a great job the draft so far and in just a couple of years he has done he's gotten closer to drafting and developing well not drafting and developing but developing a homegrown outfielder than Brian Sabian ever did. And I am talking about Luis Matos. Again, Farhan didn't you well, know, I'm with you. find him, but I do give him, I don't play, I don't play the he he draft him. He's not your guy, but he's gotten closer with Matos yes. than Sabian ever did. Well, you know, Len, that's, that's no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm sorry to cut you off, but like yeah. if Mike Yastrzemski was the everyday center fielder and the same things were happening right now, where there are X amount of games over 500, they're in a wild card spot as of today, I wouldn't feel the same. Yeah, if everything was the same, but it was Chadwick Trump behind the plate instead of Patrick Bailey. I wouldn't feel the it same. That's why I'm not outraged. Yeah. I feel really good. Like just Bailey and Matos alone make me feel encouraged that this is at least going in the right direction. I'm not ready to just say it's been an abject failure. You know, everybody needs to be blown out. I think Kapler's a good manager. I think yeah. he's made the most out of the least. Like I really do. But here's what I would say. They have to get a legitimate three, four, or five hitter. And I yeah. know they thought that Hanager could be maybe one of those guys. He's not good enough. They need one. Whether that means being bold in a trade, whether that means developing your own and, and it's Luciano and he's under our eyes the entire time, or whether that's signing a guy, if you had that, everything else would look better.
I agree. And the good news is the Giants do still have options to make that happen. We can talk about one of those potential options in a minute. You are 